a very good evening aspirants welcome to the hindi news analysis brought to you by shankar ice academy for the date 30th of january 2022 these are the list of news articles i have taken today for discussion and as you can see here today we will be discussing about an art form called as tayam then we will be discussing about extonment order we'll also see about the implications of ukraine russia issue on india then we'll see about what is hemiparasite then finally we'll end our discussion with some facts about chalukyas and their dynasty so without wasting much time let us get to the first discussion so today we are going to start our discussion with an art form called as tayam this discussion is going to be based on this photo feature article this article mentions that performance of tayam art form has been affected by the pandemic it is affected to the extent that in the past 2 years they have not performed and only recently the performance was held that to in a restricted manner in some places so this has affected the livelihood of people especially the artists so in this context let us see some important facts relevant to the examination about tayam see first of all note that tayam is one of the folk arts in north kerala it originated in north kerala it is a famous ritual art form and this folk art form is believed to be dravidian and also note that tayam is also known by the name of kaliyattam so what is it it is actually the concept of performance of goddess that means the performers wear costumes and makeup like goddess and they perform as you can see here they wear heavy makeup and add on flamboyant costumes and with that they also wear a headgear and ornaments Another fact to be noted here is that here mostly the performers are male. So male performers wear costumes and makeup like goddess and they perform. Now here the deities who are reflected in this art form are mainly mother gods such as Muchil Bhagavati and sometimes the heroes are also worshiped as tayas that is as gods. For example Kattivanur Veeran is an hero of Kerala who is worshiped in this art form. So just note that here the performance is itself known as tayattam and the appearance with the costume is called as tayaya kolam and the performers are called as kolakaran. So what is the performance actually? It involves dance, mime and music. So therefore this ceremonious dance is accompanied by chorus of musical instruments also such as the chenda, elathalam, kurumkudal and veeku chenda are used in this performance. Now while performing what happens is the performer goes into a trance and dances like as if the performer is possessed and thereby it is believed that the performer transforms into a deity now since this art form involves goddess it involves uh, many rituals also for example the first part of uh, tayam performance is known as vellattam or totam it is also known as totam pattu now this performance is performed in a lighter manner that is it is performed without any elaborate costume So here the performer narrates the origin and characteristics of different tayams. Then after this totem patu, the kolakaran appears on stage with proper makeup and costumes. As I said, kolakaran is the performer. Now depending on the nature of the tayam, facial makeup, costumes and ornaments varies. For example, there are also tayams where the performer bears fire on their hair. As you can see here, this is Ticha Mundi. This is one of the tayams performed. So totally it is said that there are about 500 tayams or we can say 500 different performances of goddess and each have their own music style and choreography however usually only 120 tayams are generally performed and the most prominent tayams involve the uh, goddess rakta chamundi kari chamundi muchilotu bhagavati etc etc so overall what you need to know is tayam is an art form using which great stories of kerala are often retold So basically this art glorifies the beliefs of ancient tribals who gave importance to the worship of heroes and the spirits of their ancestors. So when this performance generally happens, it happens from December to April. In this period, tayam performances happen in temples of Kannur and Kasaragod. Now another important fact from prelims perspective which we should know is tayam is primarily done by scheduled caste communities who are based in the districts of uh, Kasaragod, Kannur and some regions of Kodikod in northern Kerala. So the performers belong to the communities like Vannan, Malayan, Mavilan, Velan, Munnotan, Anjanotan, Pulayar, Koppalar and others. So from this discussion what you should remember is to which state this art form belongs to and what it involves that is whether it involves music dance or what and then you have to remember who performs it and which deity generally they offer it to so in this regard let us recall that this art form originated in northern kerala so it is an art form of kerala and second it involves music dance and mime 
it involves musical instruments like chenda and then we have to remember that it is performed by scheduled caste communities for example vannan community malayan mavilan velan monotan anjanotan etc and the goddesses who are reflected in this art form are rakta chamundi kari chamundi uchchal bhagavati etc now these are the few facts that you have to remember now also remember that you can use one fact from this discussion in your main sansa writing also when a question asks about the effects of pandemic on the livelihoods of people you can mention that it also affected artists and you can give the example of theyam artists so this is how you have to frame your main sansa so keeping these facts in mind let us move to the next discussion now our next discussion is based on this news article It says that an individual has approached the Supreme Court challenging the extournment order which was given by a subdivisional magistrate. Here the individual has said that he was awarded a 2 year extournment by the subdivisional magistrate under the Maharashtra Police Act. So when the individual moved the Bombay High Court challenging this order, the High Court refused to intervene. So now the person has approached the Supreme Court In this regard Supreme Court has noted some points regarding extournment order and how it infringes on fundamental rights. So in this discussion let us first see what is an extournment order and then we will see how it infringes on fundamental rights and then we will also see the observations of Supreme Court. See basically extournment order is issued to restrict the movement of a person into a particular place and this is done for a certain period of time. So this order restricts the movement of a person to a particular place for a certain period of time. Now this order is mostly issued when the authorities feel that the said person may affect the condition of the place that is that person may disturb the peace or can conduct some crime so now you would have understood that when an extournment order is given it is issued against any person who has a prior criminal conduct that is the person who has already had run-ins with the law so this extournment order is issued with the objective of preventing or restricting criminal activities in a particular place by banning that individual in that place for a period of time now this can be issued against a person or it can also be issued against a group of people now who can pass such an order see if you take the present case here the maharashtra state law was applied that law was maharashtra police act So under this the sub divisional magistrate in the districts and the deputy commissioners of police in the commissionerates they can pass the extournment order So similarly some other states also have this provision for example in Punjab we have the Punjab Security of State Act of 1953 then Assam Maintenance of Public Order Act is there then we have Karnataka Police Act is there in all these acts we have the provisions for extournment order So what will happen when a person violates this extournment order in such a case the violators are booked under the said act for example in our case if the person violates the extournment order he will be booked under the section 142 of Maharashtra Police Act this particular section provides a penalty for entering an area without permission from which the person was removed already and after this the person is also produced in court so this is the basic about extournment order now how it infringes on fundamental right and what supreme court has to say about it see supreme court stated that the extournment order must be sparingly used this is because the order deprived a person of his or her right of free movement in the country why because we saw that extournment order restricts the movement of a person to a particular place so it restricts that person's right of free movement but we know that this right of free movement is a fundamental right according to the constitution of india this fundamental right is covered under article 19 particularly it is under article 19 clause 1 sub clause d which confers the fundamental right on the citizens to move freely throughout the territory of india but here you should also remember that under clause 5 of the same article a reasonable restriction can be imposed on the freedom of movement this is we are saying because that clause mentions that anything under sub clauses d and e on these rights reasonable restrictions can be imposed by the state so here 19 clause 1d it says we have the fundamental right to move freely throughout the territory of india and on the other hand article 19 clause 5 provides the state the power to impose reasonable restriction on such freedom of movement so keeping these two articles in mind the supreme court has noted that extournment order infringes upon the fundamental right under article 19 clause 1d but since the state has the power to impose reasonable restriction the court has noted that such a restriction should stand the test of reasonableness that is it should be determined whether that order was reasonable or not 
So in this regard, Supreme Court has also noted that externment order is an extraordinary measure because it not only restricts a person's movement, but it also restricts a person even to stay in their own house with their own family. And in some cases, we can also agree that externment orders may even deprive a person of their livelihood. For example, if you are a fisherman, assume that, and you live in a coastal city. Now, an experiment order is imposed on you. Then that means you cannot enter that city. So, just because you have been banned from that city, will you let go of your livelihood? Will you just move on to other state? Will you just move on to other coastal city and start your livelihood there? It is not so. It doesn't happen often. And that is why the Supreme Court is of the opinion that this is an extraordinary measure and it should stand the test of reasonableness. And that is why it must be sparingly used. That is only used when it is of utmost necessity. Along with the Supreme Court has also stated that there must be objective material evidence. This objective material must provide reasonable satisfaction to the competent authority that the person who is in question is engaged in a commission of an offence or is about to engage in a commission of an offence and such an offence will involve force or violence or that offence is punishable under chapters 12, 16 and 17 of IPC. So, only when the competent authority is satisfied that the person in question is involved in any one of these instances, then the competent authority has the objective material, then the authority can impose reasonable restriction which is externment order. Now, here the recording of subjective satisfaction of the competent authority is sine qua non before issuing the externment order. So, sine qua non means it is an essential condition. So, the recording of such satisfaction is an essential condition before issuing the order. So, these are all the facts that you need to know about externment order and how it infringes on fundamental rights and what Supreme Court has noted in this regard. Now, before concluding our discussion, let us see how effective is this externment order in containing crime because it is imposed only to contain crime in a particular area. For example, if you take this graph, it is given by Mumbai police, you can see that the externment order is ineffective. Every year, the number of criminals arrested for violating the experiment order is higher than the number of criminals actually externed in Mumbai. For example, in 2021, 450 persons were arrested for violating their experiment order. On the other hand, only 448 criminals were externed. So, the state planned to remove 448 persons from a particular place to contain crime. But on the other hand, they again re returned to that place by violating the order. So, that is why the crime doesn't subside here. So, we can say that the experiment orders does not effectively restrict the movement of criminals. Another fact to be noted is these experiment laws are archaic, that is they are old and they were made by Bombay Police Act that to way back in 1951 if you take the case of Maharashtra. So, they were relevant in those times when criminals had no access to phones or internet but in today's technological era, the criminals may not be even physically present in a place to commit a crime because they can be virtually present in the external areas. And that is why we can say that with the arrival of technology, the externment laws have become meaningless. Then there is also another issue with the externment orders. It is said that it is often misused by political opponents to seek political vendetta. That is, just to seek political vendetta, they ban certain persons from accessing a place. And then finally, with the increasing population, such externment orders and its enforceability actually overburdens the police because they are not able to effectively enforce this order. And that is why it leads to many violations. So, these are some of the issues associated with the externment orders apart from it infringing on the fundamental rights. So, due to these issues, there are also many police who believe that there should be a facilitative process rather than a punitive process like externment order because this externment order is like a punishment. It doesn't rehabilitate the criminal. Here, the police must be facilitative. That is, the police, before announcing the experiment order, they should counsel and discuss with the person as to where that person can settle. So, here the police can even help facilitate the person to settle in a new location. Here, police can take the help of NGOs or social workers in this process. So, this will help with the issues of constant violation of experiment order. Now, since such a facilitative approach is currently not in place, the person who is externed is returning to the place and they are illegally staying in that jurisdiction. And then they are again becoming liable for rearrest. So, this leads to further criminalization of that person rather than rehabilitating him. So, these are some of the points that we need to know about externment orders and the issues with it. Now, let us move on to the next discussion. So, now let us take up this FAQ article. Yes, again, this is about the Russia-Ukraine issue. But note that this particular FAQ article talks about the matter of contestation 
between Russia and Europe. And most importantly, it mentions about the impact this issue has on the political forum. So while discussing all these aspects, it mentions about the demands of Russia and the response of US for those demands. Particularly, it highlights the significance of this issue to India. So this is the crux of this FAQ article. So in this context, today, let us see a brief introduction of the Russia-Ukraine issue. Let us brush up the basics and then we'll see what were the demands of Russia, how USA has responded and in this manner, what implications these decisions will have on India. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. Now, let us start with the discussion about the genesis of this issue. That is where this problem started actually. So, it started regarding NATO's expansion towards East. As you know, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and there are three important purposes for NATO's creation. First one is deterring uh, Soviet expansionism. Second is forbidding the revival of nationalistic militarism in Europe. And this has to be done through a strong North American presence on the continent. And then thirdly, encouraging European political integration. So these were the spelled objectives of NATO. And this is the concern for Russia. Keeping this in mind only, Russian President Vladimir Putin has demanded a ban on further expansion of NATO. See, he suddenly said this because countries like Ukraine, Georgia and other important countries in Russia's neighborhood, they are seeking NATO membership. And here particularly, Ukraine is of concern because of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine issue. So that is why Russian president is demanding a ban on further expansion of NATO. Now, this issue also has some basis because since the German unification in 1990, NATO has added new members five times. See, initially, the alliance of NATO started with 12 founding members in 1949. But as of now, it has 30 members. And this includes the three important Baltic countries, such as Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania also. And yes, you are right. These three countries share borders with Russia. Apart from this, countries like Hungary, Poland, Romania and Bulgaria, they are also members of NATO. But the issue regarding these countries is that these were all members of the former Soviet-led Warsaw Pact. So if you remember, Warsaw Pact was a collective defense treaty. It was established by the Soviet Union and seven other Soviet satellite states that were uh, present at that time in Central and Eastern Europe. This included uh, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland and Romania. So it was signed as a pact against the NATO alliance. So it created two important blocks at that time. That is the countries in the NATO alliance represented the Western bloc and the countries that were in the Warsaw Pact were in the Eastern bloc. But the issue is that the countries which belong to the Eastern Bloc, that is that were uh, a part of Warsaw Pact, they are now NATO members. And obviously, except for Russia, all of them have become NATO members. So we can say that now in the Eastern Bloc, only Russia remains, whereas NATO has Eastern Bloc members also. This is a major issue for Russia. And keeping these facts in mind, now the Russian president is asking NATO to not only ban its expansion, but he is also asking for a rollback of NATO's military deployments to the 1990s level. Because since the former Soviet satellite states are now NATO members, they are a threat to Russia also. And in this regard, Russia also demanded for a ban of deployment of intermediate range missiles in the areas. Because if these intermediate range missiles are allowed, then it will enable NATO to target and reach Russia easily. Further, Moscow has also asked NATO to curb its military cooperation with Ukraine and other former Soviet republics. In other words, Mr. Putin simply wants a halt to NATO's future expansion. But at the same time, he also wants NATO's rollback from Russia's Rimland. But this is an issue here because already Russia's military troops are gathered at Ukraine-Russia border for this purpose. You can see the uh, presence of uh, Russian military here. But as usual, Russia has denied by saying that this military presence is only to conduct a regular winter military drills in its southern region. And unfortunately, its southern region also includes borders with Ukraine. So there also its military is present. So is USA silent regarding these uh, Russian military presence? No, it is not. USA has already responded to this. Actually, here USA has taken a mixed approach involving diplomacy and economic deterrence. Here first, USA has noted that it is not going to change the open door policy of NATO. This means NATO can and will induct more members in the future. 
So this was the response given by USA regarding the ban on expansion of NATO demand of Russia. Now, regarding the Russia's demand of ban of military deployments, USA has said that it would continue to offer training and weapons to Ukraine. But here you should note that USA did not entirely close the opportunity for talks in this front. Actually, it has said that still it is open to discussing missile deployment in Eastern Europe and it is ready for a mutual reduction in military exercises in the region. Now here we should also note the fact that USA has ruled out sending troops to Ukraine or taking other direct military measures against Russia if there is an event of invasion of Ukraine. But on the other hand, USA has already threatened to impose severe economic sanctions on Russia if it makes any military move. So that is why here we are saying US has taken a mixed approach of diplomacy and economic deterrence. It is not going to engage militarily. So this was the issue so far and we saw the demands of Russia and the response to those demands by USA. Now what is the implication of these issues for India? See basically any military action between Russia and USA will have adverse impacts for India because such a military action will definitely involve USA. Even though it is saying it will not involve militarily, we can assume that there will be US involvement. Now it will have adverse impacts for India mainly because India has a strategic partnership with both Moscow and Washington that is with Russia and USA. So we can say that India is in the middle of the relationship between Russia and USA regarding this Russia-Ukraine issue. Now let us see whether India will have positive or negative impacts in the future. See it is expected that the current Russia-Ukraine issue will culminate into two things. First thing either it will lead to a US-Russia deal or second it could even lead to a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now in either scenarios India has major implications. Let us see how. Here let us take the first case. That is what will happen if there is a US-Russia deal. This could mean that Russia will slow down its pace of relationship with China. And this will give India the opportunity to build and reset its Russian ties. Now along with this, if there is also a positive improvement in US-Iran relationship also, then this will pave way for India, Russia and Iran to work on the International North-South Transportation Project. See, this project has already been delayed by the sanctions imposed by USA on Iran and Russia. So, if on one hand, USA and Russia agree for a deal, and on the other hand, USA also has a positive relationship with Iran, then this will lead to the project of International North-South Transportation to continue. So, we can say that if that is a US-Russia deal, then this could end positively for India. So, now what will happen if there is a Russian invasion? If this happens, Russia will rupture its relationship with USA and its allies. So this will again lead to a pressure on India to choose between Western alliance involving USA and Russia. That is here, USA will be on one side and Russia will be other side. And again, India will be in a position to choose between both. So this could lead to many other uh, implications for India also. For example, this could lead to CATSA sanctions on India on account of S-400 purchase. As you know, India has purchased S-400 missile from Russia and the USA has already threatened India of imposing CATSA sanctions. We have discussed this issue in detail on our November 11th, 2021 Hindi News Analysis. You can view that analysis to know more about this issue. So if Russia and USA's relationship further declines, then it will lead to CATSA sanctions on India also. Apart from this, USA could also demand India to cut its defense ties with Russia. But will India be able to do this? No, because India is heavily dependent on Russia due to its armed forces, which is dependent on Russian spares and equipment for the foreseeable future. Further, this will also hinder India's interest in preventing a further deepening uh, Russia's ties with China. Now, on the other hand, if the Russian military action is taken against Ukraine and it is met with Western backlash, this means that on this front, Russia will need the support of China even more. So it poses a strategic challenge for India because this will lead to a close Sino-Russian relationship. But even beyond this, a close Russia to Beijing would be particularly problematic in this current moment for India because India is heavily dependent on Russian military supplies. And as we know, already Sino-Indian border tensions are happening and this will continue to happen in the future also. So here you can see that Russia will be in between India and China. That is, Russia will have to choose between India and China. So in this scenario, what will happen if Beijing asks Moscow to stall military supplies to India? 
that is what will russia do at the time when it needs china's support due to this ukraine crisis and on the other hand it has to supply military equipments to india but china is asking it to not to supply these equipments in this scenario china's aim will be to force russia to choose a side that is either to choose china totally or india here only we need to remember the 1962 that is when moscow needed china's backing during the cuban missile crisis see at this time this issue led to china being an ally of uh, soviet union at the same time india was called as a friend by the soviet union so here china was the ally and india was the friend so we can say that russia maintained a diplomatic balance between china and india at that time so we can expect that in this scenario also russia will maintain its diplomatic balance and it will abstain from choosing sides but the problem is if russia involves in any military action against ukraine then it will affect india's efforts to maintain a delicate balance between india's relationship with usa europe and russia other than this there are also other problematic aspects in the russia ukraine crisis for uh, india for example india has economic and defense trade ties with ukraine so this will get affected if russia invades ukraine and then we have more than 7000 indian diaspora residing in ukraine they will also get affected and secondly if there is a russian invasion that means in europe the situation is deteriorating so this will draw usa's attention away from indo pacific theater see usa's attention in indo pacific is important because of china's aggression in the indo pacific region So if USA's attention is diverted then here China may gain and it will go against India's wishes. This could be already seen when USA handled Afghanistan and Middle East crisis because in this time America was focused on uh, Afghanistan and Middle East crisis when India wanted USA to be focused on the China challenge. So that means if there is any indication that the Russia Ukraine crisis could become a full blown war then India has to take steps. So in this regard India has already taken certain steps for example India has already called for a peaceful resolution of the situation through sustained diplomatic efforts for long term peace and stability in the region and beyond Here you should remember that this was the standard position of India during the Crimean crisis also that is at the time when Russia annexed Crimea and we should also remember that india has always maintained neutrality it hasn't openly criticized or openly supported russia's actions for example even after uh, crimean annexation india abstained from a vote in the un general assembly regarding a resolution this resolution was sought to condemn russia regarding its annexation but india abstained from voting so this showed that india didn't want to support or go against russia it maintained neutrality but on the other hand if you see in november 2020 when ukraine sponsored a resolution in un general assembly which sought to condemn alleged human rights violations in crimea in this resolution india voted against ukraine so here we can say that india actually chose a side that is it chose the side of russia by going against ukraine but still if diplomatically you ask the indian government they will say they are maintaining neutrality but then again when this ukraine russia issue started india said that it is going back to its post 2014 status quo that is it will maintain neutrality in the ukraine issue also so finally if you ask me whether there will be a war or not we cannot actually say at this point of time because now russia is saying that usa's response did not address its core concerns but at the same time russia has also said that there is room for more dialogue So that means they are okay for continuing with the diplomatic activities rather than going for a military conflict. But still it is too early to say whether war is imminent or not. We have to just wait and see. But here India needs to be mindful of the fact that it cannot support the coercive military occupation of a country's territory by another country. Because India upholds territorial integrity and sovereignty. It is vital for us particularly in a scenario when our neighboring countries are trying to annex our territories to their countries for example as you already know there is continuous pressure from china where it is trying to take certain territories from ladakh and even it claims around 93000 square kilometers of arunachal pradesh as its own and on the western front we have pakistan which is claiming the pakistan occupied kashmir as its own territory So in these scenarios India is saying its territorial integrity and sovereignty is applicable in these regions so it will uphold it 
so this same stance should also be used by india in case of russia ukraine issue and we can say that mostly india has acted according to this principle only for example even though india has excellent relations with russia it has not recognized the independence of kazia and south ossetia from georgia see the independence of these regions was a result of the military conflict between russia and georgia in august 2008 but india has not recognized the independence of these territories because these territories were a part of georgia and now they are not and similarly even though india is having extensive and wide ranging relations with usa it has not recognized kosovo which declared its independence from serbia in february 2008 here usa stood solidly behind kosovo since it's separated from serbia but on the other hand india didn't recognize kosovo so we can say that in the past instances also india has abstained from recognizing those territories which challenge the territorial integrity and sovereignty of a country so the author of this faq article is suggesting that india should maintain this stance and india should also remember that it is enjoying a comprehensive global strategic partnership covering almost all areas of human endeavor with usa and this partnership is driven by democratic values and convergence of interests on a range of issues on the other hand we also have a special and privileged strategic partnership with russia so both russia and usa are highly valued partners for india so india should be judicious to not take any sides under the current circumstances So the conclusion is India should continue to adopt a balanced neutral approach as it has done so far. So these are the points that you need to take note from this discussion where we saw about Russia Ukraine issue in brief we saw Russia's demands we saw the response of USA and most importantly we saw the implications of these issues on India and what will happen if there is a US Russia deal or on the other hand what will happen if there is a Russian invasion of Ukraine. And finally we came to a conclusion that India should maintain a neutral approach and it should value its own principle of territorial integrity and sovereignty. So with these points in mind now let us move on to the next discussion. So our next discussion is going to be based on this news article. It reports the discovery of a new genus of a parasitic flowering plant. It has been discovered from the biodiversity hotspot of Nicobar group of islands. So in this discussion we'll understand what do we mean by a parasitic plant and then we'll also see what is a hemiparasitic plant which is mentioned in this news article and then we'll see their significance. So before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. So first of all what do we mean by the word parasite? See a parasite is a living organism that lives on or lives with or lives inside a larger species in order to extract nutrients. So here the objective of that parasite is to extract nutrients. Now in simple words we can say that a parasite is an organism that lives on or lives in a host and gets its food from that host or at the expense of that host. Now in some cases such parasites can harm the host and in other situations they can be completely harmless also. Now we all would have uh, come across a parasite which is lice. It could be found on people's heads and bodies. Now here for lice we are the hosts and it lives by sucking the blood out of human beings. Now you may be thinking why we are calling a plant genus as parasitic. See these parasites can be both plants and animals. It could even be a single celled organism or a multicellular organism such as a plant. Now one such plant genus is discovered in Nicobar group of islands. Its genus name is Septemeranthus and they are parasitic flowering plants. This genus grows on the plant species called as Horsfieldia glabra warb. So this specific genus that is Septemeranthus has modified root structure. This root structure sp- spreads on the stem of a tree and it is anchored inside the bark of the host tree. So since it is anchored inside the bark of the host tree it will be getting its nutrients from that host tree and that is why this flowering plant is called as parasitic flowering plant. So now that is a unique feature about this genus because it belongs to the family Loranthaceae. So this family Loranthaceae is hemiparasite. We just saw what do we mean by a parasite. Now what is this hemiparasite? See here the word hemi itself means half. So that means these are partially parasitic in nature. That is hemiparasites like any other plants they also possess chlorophyll and they can typically carry out photosynthesis and this will partially fulfill its food needs. 
but still they are partially parasitic they are parasitic on the roots or shoots of a plant host so through this they get their nutrients from the host also now another important point to note here is that loranthaceae is found all over the country but the newly discovered genus which we are seeing in the news is endemic only to the nicobar group of islands so remember septemeranthus is endemic to nicobar group of islands so overall the newly found genus are parasitic in nature but they are not fully parasitic that is why we are saying they are hemiparasites so even though they have green leaves which are capable of photosynthesis through which they can have their food they still derive their nutrients from their hosts and they are endemic only to nicobar group of islands now what about their significance see they are essential in forest ecology pathology and medicine plus they can function as both predators and prey see they act like predators when they feed on hosts alternatively they can also serve as important sources of prey that is they will be the prey for other predators for example in case of frugivorous birds these flowering plants they provide food for the frugivorous birds see here the term frugivorous means the birds which feed on fruits also but here we should note one point which is that when they become prey it can serve as a vehicle of transmission that is it will allow this parasite to move from one host to another for example imagine that a parasitic plant or a hemiparasitic plant is providing food for frugivorous birds now the bird consumes its seeds which belongs to this new genus now the problem with these seeds of this genus is that they have the potential of pseudo viviparous germination See, we call a plant as viviparous plant when the seeds generated by the plant begin to germinate while they are still on the parent's body. So, after consumption, the seeds get deposited on the leaves and branches of their same plant, which are already attached to their host plants. So, after germination, the life cycle of the genus starts all over again. This process might also transfer the seeds to another host as well. Now as a conclusion just note that recently a new species in the hemiparasitic family Loranthaceae was uh, discovered from Nicobar group of islands this species is called as Dendrophthora algae so with these points in mind now let us move on to the next discussion now our last discussion for the day is going to be based on this article from the Hindu magazine it talks about the Chalukya emperors and their successors who ruled over the vast Deccan plateau for nearly 500 years now their period of rule is too often ignored because it does not fall within a north indian imperial moment but still their rule is important because it is said that during this time the deccan transformed from a dusty anarchic region to an irrigated urban artistically sophisticated and highly connected landmass and this in turn profoundly shaped the history of india and the world so in this context let us see some facts about chalukyas especially the chalukyas of kalyani from prelims point of view see the chalukyas of kalyani followed the imperial traditions of vatapi chalukyas and the rashtragutas of manyakheta their period was a period of cultural efflorescence of karnataka here you should note that the chalukyas of kalyani claim to be the close kitten kin of vatapi chalukyas and some evidences also state that the chalukyas were an indigenous kannada family belonging to the occupation of uh, agriculture and military background they settled in and around the badami region and they say that the founder of the western chalukya dynasty was tailapa 2 see the western chalukya dynasty is also called as the chalukyas of kalyani or simply kalyana here kalyana was the capital of this dynasty so initially the capital was located at manyakheta and later it was moved to kalyana now the tailapa 2 was succeeded by his son satyasraya and it is said that he won over a chola invader satyasraya was followed in succession by vikramaditya 5 then jayasimha 1 and then jagadekamala now here jagadekamala claims to have defeated a bhoja king a ruler of malwa the bhoja king called as paramara bhoja who was the ruler of malwa region and he even said to have defeated the king rajendra belonging to chola dynasty now after him someswara 1 ruled the region then someswara 1 was succeeded by his son someswara 2 it is said that someswara 1 actually wanted to make his second son who is named as vikramaditya 6 as the successor but initially vikramaditya 6 refused so someswara 2 was made the ruler but then a civil war broke out and in the civil war vikramaditya 6 won and he became the ruler and based on this a book was written by the poet bihana 
This book is called as Vikramanaka Devacharita. Now in this book the poet Bihana has also noted that Someswara I actually built the city of Kalyana and made it the capital of their kingdom. Now then after Vikramaditya VI his son followed who was named Someswara III. Now Someswara III was succeeded by Jagadmala II. Jagadmala II was followed by his son Tailapa III and then Someswara IV ascended the Chalukya throne. Someswara IV was the son of Tailapa III. But it is said that Someswara IV failed to safeguard the Chalukyan power and he was defeated in 1190 AD. He was defeated by a Hoysala king named Hoysala Balala II and with this defeat ended the western Chalukyan power of Kalyani. Along with this the death of Vikramaditya VI actually saw the beginning of the decline of Chalukyan power. See at that time their subordinates were Kakatiyas of Varangal, the Yadavas of Devagiri, the Hoysalas of Dwar Samudra and the Kalachuris were also their subordinates. But when Vikramaditya VI died they began to take advantage of the weakness of the rulers and began to make preparation to declare their own independence from the Chalukyan kingdom. So it is said that the Chalukyas of Kalyana disappeared from the arena of political power by 1190 AD especially during the reign of Someswara IV. So this was about the emperors of dynasty Chalukya. Now let us see their administrative process. See the Chalukyas of Kalyana followed the hereditary monarchical form of government. You would have noticed this in their name itself. They were either named Vikramaditya or Someswara or Tailapa. Now in their kingdom the king was the head of the state with effective power and interestingly we should note that the Chalukyan queens and even other family members were actively involved in the administrative process of the kingdom for example there are evidences which state that queen lakshmi devi who was the wife of vikramaditya VI and then lachala mahadevi who was the wife of someswara I and then ketala devi who was another queen of someswara I they all participated in administration Now along with the kings the ministers posts were also hereditary at that time now for administrative convenience the territory was divided as rashtra vishaya nadu kampana and tana actually there is no clear cut demarcation between rashtra vishaya and nadu but we could see that vishaya and nadu are considered as smaller units than rashtra Now it is also believed that during the rule of Chalukyas of Kalyani even though caste was universal and hereditary the connection between caste and occupation was not rigid and as we already saw the women of higher strata of society played an important role in social and administrative matters including the queens of the kingdom now we should also note that the chalukyas of kalyani patronized fine arts It is said that in 145 AD they constructed Nataka Sala that is a theater in the premises of a Jain temple and there are also references to flutists songsters florists drummers and dancers belonging to this dynasty actually this temple was the greater promoter of fine arts for example architecture sculpture in stone and metal and painting were promoted by the temples an inscription even refers to a great sculptor who is named as Nagoja This sculptor was called Kandrana Vidyadirajam that is the master of art of engraving. Now apart from fine arts trade and commerce and agriculture were also the backbone of the economy of the Chalukyan state. So majority of people were engaged in agriculture as an occupation. So the rulers also encouraged agricultural operations by providing irrigational facilities like excavation of tanks, construction of irrigation canals which increased the fertility of the soil. Now when we are talking about land we should mention that during their time the cultivated land is classified as wetland dry land and garden land and the tax was also collected from agriculturalists but it was not uniform and it and it varied from area to area an inscription from koli paikai records mentioned that the lands were actually classified as uttama madhyama and adhama on the basis of fertility and yield and from the names uttama madhyama and adhama we can say that it means best middle and least we could assume that it could mean these now along with this note that private ownership of the land also existed during this time along with joint ownership now if we talk about languages kannada and sanskrit flourished during this period and then some of the well known scholars are uh, santinatha and nagavarmacharya see santinatha was the author of sukumara chaitra apart from this we also saw about the poet bilana He wrote Vikramanka Deva Charita that is it was the historical kavya on the life of Vikramaditya VI and then Someswara III also wrote a book called as Manasulasa 
So these are some of the points that we need to know from prelims perspective regarding the Chalukyan kingdom. We saw about their administrative setup, the important kings. We saw how the land is classified. We saw their occupation, and finally, we saw some of the important scholars and books. Now let us move to the final discussion, which is the practice questions discussion session. Now let us take up this first question. It asks, according to constitution, which of the following can be used by the government to impose reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right of freedom of expression? See the reasonable restrictions regarding the freedom of expression is given under Article 19, Clause 2. It mentions that the government may impose reasonable restrictions upon the freedom of speech in the interest of certain factors. So now the given options in the question are public order, decency, modesty of women, defamation, morality. Now the ones mentioned in Article 19, Clause 2 are sovereignty and integrity of India, the security of the state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality, or in relation to contempt of court, defamation, incitement to an offence. Now, since the question is regarding the reasonable restrictions imposed based on the constitutional provision, we can say that modesty of women is not in this list, so three should not be in the answer. Therefore, the correct answer to this question is option B, one, two, four, and five only. Now, our next question is a pair-based question. On one side, the name of interaction is given, and on the other side, benefits are given. First pair given is mutualism, and the benefit is both the species benefits. Second pair is competition. The benefit is both the species loses. Third pair is parasitism, and the benefit is one species benefits and detrimental to other. So even though you do not know about the interactions like mutualism, competition, and parasitism, just by knowing these English terms, you can at least attend this question. For example, mutual means it is present in both and having benefits, and competition means both are competing. And parasites, as we saw in the discussion, they mean that here one species takes advantage of. the other so that means it is detrimental to the other species so from this english definition itself we can say that all the three pairs are correctly matched and therefore the correct answer to this question is option c 1 2 and 3 See from environmental perspective we should note that in nature the animals plants and microbes they cannot and do not live in isolation but they interact in various ways to form a biological community so even in small communities many interactive links exist but not all of them are obvious So there is an interspecific interaction which exists between two different species, and such interspecific interaction could be beneficial, det- detrimental, or neutral. That is, there will be no harm or no benefit. So in this regard, such interactions are classified into mutualism, competition, predation, parasitism, commensalism, amensalism. Now in this table you can see that plus is given on one side and minus is also mentioned in some places. Now here plus means gains and minus means loss. Now here mutualism means both species benefit on the other hand in a competition both the species lose and then in both parasitism and predation only one species benefits and here the interaction is detrimental to the other species now the interaction where one species is benefited and the other is neither benefited nor harmed this will be called as commensalism that is why here zero is mentioned it is neither gain nor a losing point and then here amensalism means one species is harmed whereas the other is unaffected so just know these terms it is very important from the prelims perspective now let us take up the next prelims question which of the following works does not come under the period of western chalukyas option a bilanas vikramanka deva charita option b someshwaras manasolasa option d vigyanishwaras mitakshara and option d sakatayanas amoga vritti Now here the correct answer is option D let us see why so during discussion itself we saw about bilana actually the chalukyan king vikramaditya 6 had two scholars in his court one was bilana and the other was vigyaneshwara now here bilana wrote vikramanka devacharita and then vigyaneshwara wrote mitakshara so option A and C are correct now someshwara 3 was the son of vikramaditya 6 and he was also a scholar himself and he wrote manasolasa and this manasolasa is also called as abhilashitartha chintamani so that is why b is also correct now here the option d mentions about amoga vritti book it is a grammar book which is written by sakatayana it was written during the reign of rashtrakutas so the correct answer is option d now with this prelims question let us take up one mains question it is based on our discussion on russia ukraine issue in this question you have to discuss the implications of this issue on india you have to write the answer in 150 words interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section 
So viewers, with this we have come to the end of Indian analysis session for today. If you like this video, don't forget to like and comment. Also share this video with your friends if you find it useful and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for receiving timely updates regarding civil services preparation. Thank you.